such a, a cold and bitter night. <coughs> so welcome to the uh, restarting of our History of Medicine uh, lectures. Great pleasure tonight to welcome uh, our speaker, Professor Barbara Brooks from the Department of History and uh, Art History. And her topic is At Home in the Asylum. So I won't say any more than that. Barbara will <laughs> tell us the details. Thank you, Barbara. All right. Hello. Thank you all for coming on this grim and gloomy night, and I'm about to be Barbara Brooks Emeritus, or Emerita. Um, I retire on Tuesday, so you just uh. got in before I leave town, so that's good. <laughs> I put some propaganda about uh, a medical humanities blog that I do with Sue Wooden, and we encourage people to write for us, so take the card if you'd like to. Yeah. Yeah. All right. At home in the asylum. What makes a home? Everyone present probably has an opinion on that. I want to think about the everyday elements of home. Clothing, food, warmth, sleep and company. How did it feel to go from a modest cottage to the Seacliff Asylum? Clearly it was different for a shepherd living in an upcountry hut a middle-class person from a substantial household, a domestic servant who lived in a garret, or a seaman who occupied a berth on a crowded ship, like this man here, who left Mauritius at a small boy, uh, and obviously had traveled the world. In the late 19th century, Charitable bodies, such as the Benevolent Association and the Central Government, built new institutions to house those who had fallen on misfortune. Can everyone hear me all right? No. <coughs> Somebody can't hear me? Would you like to move up a little? No? Are you all right? Okay. All right. I will project more. <laughs> um, So often individuals had no homes or those they shared their home life, they shared it with a family who found their behaviour to be intolerable. The latter was the main event that led to an individual's committal to an asylum. Often today, asylums are seen as prisons. Yet the impetus in creating asylums was exactly the opposite. The Otago Provincial Councillors, for example, in requesting the government to build a proper asylum, argued that, and I quote, lunatics should be regarded by the state as objects of tender solicitude and that no pains or expense should be spared and ameliorating their condition. <coughs> so their aim was to separate prisoners or those guilty of crimes from those who were ill through no fault of their own. Mm. Eventually substantial funds, 78,000 pounds, which is equivalent to about 15 million today, were expended for a grand asylum building at Seacliff to house the mentally ill. So this, um, these are not New Zealand postcards, but I just want to use this as an illustration of the pride that communities took in building grand establishments for the mentally ill. These are American postcards, I think one's British and one's American, uh, displaying the asylum they had built to separate those who are mentally ill from prisoners, from criminals. So that is the intent behind the building of asylums. The grandeur of the building stood as testimony to the community's commitment to care. It also meant that Dunedin businesses stood to gain from the needs of a large, substantially state-funded institution. 
Here are the words of one patient admitted to an American asylum in 1878, the year that the architect Robert Lawson was commissioned to build the building at Seacliff. So this articulate woman wrote, Before I had been an inmate of the asylum for a week, I felt a greater degree of contentment that I had felt for a year previous. Not only was I reconciled to life, but because my unhappy condition of mind was understood, I was treated accordingly. Besides, I was surrounded by others in like bewildered, discontented mental states in whose miseries I found myself becoming interested, my sympathies becoming aroused. And at the same time, I too was treated as an insane woman, a kindness not hitherto shown me. So this woman found acknowledgement of a disordered mind and the order and regularity of routine in the asylum to be a great comfort. Much later from Seacliff in 1914, a 21-year-old woman, diagnosed with acute mania, wrote cheerfully to her mother, This is the best holiday I have ever had, I have ever spent, in any one place. This is the Garden of Eden to me. I have made up my mind to live here for a few years. Yet other patients were moved to write back to the asylum, thanking staff for kindness while under the asylum's care. Our views of 19th century asylums are clouded, I believe, by the more recent past. In the 1940s, the time of Janet Frame's sojourn at Seacliff, which she wrote up so powerfully in Faces in the Water, asylums were overcrowded and doctors were desperate for any therapeutic remedy. They were willing to try invasive surgery out of therapeutic desperation and the buildings were run down. I want to focus our attention on an earlier period when optimism remained that moral treatment, sympathy, rest, good food and meaningful work were thought to assist people to regain their mental health. Specifically, I want to think about the work of making the asylum like home. The work that Frederick Truby King primarily carried out over his long tenure of 30 years as medical superintendent of what was initially the largest public building in New Zealand. For King, cheerfulness and comfort were essential to attempts at cure. Does anybody standing down the back want to come and sit? You right? I feel like I'm yelling, but can you... <laughs> is it okay? Yeah, <laughs> can, you, can you hear me now? Yeah, okay. Uh, so for King, cheerfulness and comfort were essential to attempts at cure. He instructed nurses that the extent to which patients' lives could be made enjoyable must always depend mainly upon the kindness, thoughtfulness and friendly feeling of the attendants. And the attendants at first were generally male, uh, recruited from a kind of military background as all these guys kind of look like here. How did King, who was a long-stay resident himself for 30 years at the asylum, although he always had the option of leaving, how did he work to make the asylum homely in its material aspects? And how might we judge his success? I'm going to begin with the building. The respected architect R.A. Lawson was commissioned to undertake the design of the Seacliff Asylum and he built a grand building, no doubt with English models on, in mind, but built on unstable ground. 
and here are his drawings for the design of the asylum. So a lot of public money is going in to this building and there's a good book about the building uh, by Norman Ledgerwood. The grandeur reflected the pride communities took, as I've said, providing for those disordered in mind. In many ways, the panning was for a village, not a home, because of the sheer size of the building and the need for a variety of staff. A well-ordered asylum was thought to create a well-ordered body. Planned as a farm asylum, it was to be self-sustaining and to offer patients a therapeutic relationship away from bothersome social demands, but in harmony with nature. Subject to controversy throughout the build, Lawson lowered the planned central tower in the interests of cost, but refused to change the aspect in accordance with the advice of Dr. James Hector, who was director of the Geological Survey. Hector suggested the building would, I quote, better had been planned to stand facing north. By this means, the frontage would have a warmer aspect. By the time it was completed and slippage had occurred, the Inspector General noted <coughs> that the external aspect was inexpressibly dreary and depressing. So the building was built on unstable ground and it soon started crumbling in various ways. Internally, things were not much better. The two large halls, for example, had no furniture and no means of lighting. And the building was declared to be wretchedly cold. Hector believed the architect had blundered in designing the dormitory windowsills at a level that meant no view was possible for the patients. This was the asylum to which King came in mid-1889 and which he set about transforming in line with current ideas about moral treatment. The asylum superintendent was in charge of every aspect of the asylum, from employing the staff, admitting and treating the patients, planning the farm so the asylum could be self-provisioning and therefore economical, and entertainments. King and his wife Bella arrived to find they had to occupy the reception rooms of the asylum since the planned house for the superintendent was, wasn't ready. So um, they <coughs> lived in these uh, initial rooms off the entrance that were supposed to be for the reception of patients. The kings therefore lived at the heart of the asylum and this meant that the grand entrance could not be used for its intended purpose and the backdoor route became the one through which patients and goods were received. Their house was not completed until 1892. And these are the plans uh, for their house. King got to work immediately. <coughs> Letters flew from his pen, ordering supplies of all kinds, answering relatives' inquiries, letting the Inspector General of Asylums know the extent of improvements required. One of the important tasks was keeping abreast of maintenance payments, the cost of having a home. This is a 45-year-old serviceman who was admitted to the asylum. Families, if able, were expected to contribute to the cost of their relative stay. This was a complicated business. For example, patient John White had three different methods of payment, £15 <coughs> per annum from trustees of his estate, two shillings weekly maintenance order made by a resident magistrate against one of his relatives in Omaru, and a brother paying two shillings a week. So the su superintendent has to keep track <coughs> of all these payments from relatives. Truby King was also um, required to inquire of people in the community 
as to relatives' ability to pay. So if you looked like you were reasonably well off but weren't paying, he had to write to you and say, I believe that you have more resources at your disposal and you need to pay properly. The accounts for patients were kept separately, these different orders, um, so that in case of a default, the responsible party could be sued. So they wanted to keep track of who it was wasn't paying. In a common type of letter, King wrote to one Mr Crawford in May 1890, I understand your circumstances are such as would warrant us asking a larger weekly contribution towards the support of your wife in this asylum than we presently receive. I have to inform you that you will be expected to pay at the rate of 15 shillings per week. So you can see how the superintendent's time is taken up with all sorts of administrative matters, never mind the patients in the asylum. In addition, there was the hiring and payments of staff. And here's a very bad slide, I have to say, of nurses. Uh, King actually instituted training for nurses and wrote a training uh, book for the nurses uh, at Seacliff. King's exasperation with the Seacliff building showed in a letter to the Inspector General on the 2nd of May, 1890. I quote, I am in charge of this asylum and I am supposed to be a competent sanitarian. I find on investigation that the building is in a condition which jeopardises the health and life of all its inmates. Surely it should not have been left for a doctor or any other asylum official to discover that a building containing 450 inhabitants had sewer gas from nearly a mile of absolutely unventilated sewer pouring into it night and day. King began designing a new sewage system and drainage system to circumvent these problems and tried to convince the Inspector General that his plans would serve better than those offered by Wellington. And here is um, him describing how the slippage has broken sewer pipes, uh, that it's impossible, and he suggests a better way to deal with it. The bureaucracy was cumbersome. It was not always clear what, um, what was the responsibility of the public works department, the arm of government that dealt with public works, or of the inspector general or whether things should be charged to the asylum accounts or to the central government. Dealing with this bureaucracy became an important part of King's work. So we needn't think that there was a golden age when we didn't have to deal with bureaucracy. <laughs> he couldn't delegate it to any administrator. King also dealt with letters from relatives. Uh, this is a uh, domestic, 25-year-old domestic servant. Sometimes he had good news to impart, as when patients were ready to go out on probation with their families. Sometimes families wrote in to let him know how their loved one was doing once home. In reply to one husband, King laid out his rules for mental health. I was exceedingly pleased to learn that your wife is doing well, and I hope there may be no relapse. You must be careful to protect her from any strain or anxiety, and must see that she always has plenty of good nourishing food, a well-ventilated house, some exercise daily in the fresh air, and cheerful companionship. But sometimes the news he had to convey was exceedingly grim. In May 1890, King responded in depth to inquiries from a distressed daughter whose mother had committed suicide in the asylum. He had been away when the incident occurred, but he explained how the staff were stretched because the matron and most of the senior attendants were ill in bed with influenza. There had been 60 cases of influenza in the asylum in three weeks, and many were of a severe nature. It meant that all the laundresses and three unskilled women from town had to be used as temporary attendants. 
he had not placed Mrs H, the, the, the mother, in the refractory ward where she would have been under constant surveillance because he thought it would be cruel. Although she was disturbed and irresponsible, she had, he said, her reasoning powers and many sensibilities and susceptibilities almost intact, unlike the refractory ward patients. It was those powers, perhaps, which led her to secrete herself in a bedroom and hang herself. Outbreaks of influenza were no doubt exacerbated by the freezing conditions of the building. Bedrooms were supposed to be heated with fireplaces, the cheerful hearth of the home. Unfortunately, however, the fire guards were insecure and in July 1890, a woman managed by shaking the lock to get into the fire. Fortunately, she was discovered in time, but her clothes were burned nearly to the skin. To prevent such accidents, two or sometimes three attendants' time had to be taken up just with watching the fires. To improve patients' lives and to free up attendants for more useful work, Truby King planned to heat the rooms by hot water radiator systems. If only the central government would pay for it. I think it's a kind of interesting to think about planning a hospital now, isn't it? You know, I mean, clearly the architect thought, how nice and cheerful to have fires in the patient's rooms. I didn't realise that those people might, you know, do bad things with fires. <laughs> um, anyway. Uh, I'm just keeping the patients in mind here through these images. So this is uh, a Chinese man admitted uh, to the asylum. Heat was one problem, the dreary and depressing decor another. King set about having the corridors and rooms painted in different colours, replacing the sombre greens and blues that had prevailed. He advertised in the Otago Daily Times for presence of books, illustrated papers, or pictures suitable for framing to enliven the walls. He thanked a Mr. Walter of the Occident Hotel for a number of American magazines. He and Bella King added plants, ferns, and flowers to the walls, and he was a great gardener externally at the asylum, and uh, there's a book about that. Floors could be improved, he suggested, by the purchase of Grecian-bordered Walter's linoleum, which made me look up such linoleum. From Sargood, Sun and Ewan in Dunedin, he ordered orange sheepskin mats, and he also worked hard beautifying the grounds. He ordered grass seed to create lawns and playing fields, and he set about planting flower beds. He tore down enclosed airing courts, you know, these kind of prison-like yards where people couldn't see anything, where they were supposed to exercise. And uh, he, he wanted to give patients better views, and he put men who were able to work to work in the gardens and on the farm. Women's work was generally inside, sewing and other domestic work. Nothing, King believed, tended to aggravate mental troubles more than idleness, so work was really important, he felt, to recovery. King encouraged patients in their interests, and I, I gave this talk last year, and I was sent after it by Austin G. this wonderful image of the accommodation of the smallest residents of Seacliff. This <laughs> is the guinea pig house. <laughs> So King obviously allowed someone who loved guinea pigs to fulfill their idea of creating a home for the guinea pigs. And it's just lovely because this one's trying to get back in. <laughs> so these are two, these are Steropticon slides um, in the National Library taken by a local man, William Williams. Um, so he encouraged people to follow the you know, their desires in terms of creativity. And probably the most uh, well-known case of that, which I'm not going to get into in detail, is that of Lionel Terry, who we don't respect for other reasons, but, you know, King was interested that he liked to paint and things like that. 
As well as believing in the curative powers of productive work, King sought entertainment for the patients. In February 1890, he instructed the traffic manager at Dunedin Railway Station to see that an extra carriage was attached to the cattle train to town which passed Seacliff at 1am on Wednesday morning as a party of gentlemen given entertainment here on Tuesday night and they wished to return to town that same night. He decided to start a string, string band and asked for authorisation to buy instruments. When hiring a plumber as an artisan attendant at the asylum, he stated he preferred a musical man. Advertisements for attendants frequently asked for musical talent of some kind. When the Dunedin Orchestral Society offered to give a concert at the asylum, he thanked them and suggested that they chose a moonlit night. King saw to it that the Congregational Church Choir were issued 25 first-class tickets to Seacliff to perform for the patients. He ordered slides of interesting scenes to interest the patients with magic lantern shows. A medical student writing in 1899 described a visit, he called it to the Temple of Delusions, Seacliff, noting the conviviality of an evening dancing and singing in which nurses, warders and patients all took part. The asylum routine revolved around work, sleep and meals. Patients who were well enough were encouraged to work as therapy. And as I've said, outdoor on the farm, or King also started a fishing station at Karatani, where he had a holiday home. I'm not going to say much about that work, uh, apart from the fact that some men used the opportunity of working outside to abscond from the asylum. And King was roundly criticised by the wider community for giving patients such freedom. In response to the public outcry about an escape in 1909, when the absconder apparently set fire to the Presbyterian Church at Waitati, he wrote, It is as obvious to the public as it is to ourselves that we have no adequate means of keeping such patients unless we resort to the closest form of punishment and transform our institutions from hospitals into prisons. King under, came under fire in particular for sending six elderly men who he held did not need any special attendance or treatment and who were endowed with fair memory and reasoning powers to live in Dunedin in a small hotel, only to find that the community wanted them sent back to the asylum, although he could not find that they were guilty of any crime greater than smoking or playing euchre. <laughs> So it's the community wants to be rid of these people. I think it's useful to remember that. King was clean to cl classify and separate patients, setting up different facilities for the criminally insane, epileptics and inebriates. He provided the first open reception and early treatment ward in New Zealand in 1898, a principle which is extended to become the villa design of later hospitals. He fought for resources to enable better accommodation and he donated his own um, house at Karatani for the treatment of returned servicemen with shell shock in the First World War and he had this special ward built for returned servicemen at Seacliff. Unlike some institutional regimes, King let patients wear their own clothes if they had an adequate supply and if they didn't destroy them. Families required reminding of their relatives' needs. He wrote a patient's father in Mosgiel in April 1894, requesting, and I quote, that you supply clothing for your son, both tweed suit and underclothing, his present stock being nearly worn out. A patient's daughter was asked to supply one tweed dress, a pair of soft kid boots, size six, two woolen singlets, and one jersey. The wife of a patient transferred to Seeker from Ashburn Hall, um, the man was the patient, she believed that her husband should dress well. 
Truby King reminded her that the underclothing the patient had come with was so worn out as to be unfit for continued use, and that if she wanted her husband to wear white shirts, some new ones must be provided. As to white handkerchiefs, Mr H picked them to pieces and tries to get rid of them, so you don't expect such things to last. Mrs H was asked to send 12 collars, 2 shirts, 4 pairs of socks, 2 singlets and 1 pair of drawers. I just want to remind you, you know, that people need clothing. You know, it's part of our home, isn't it, having drawers full of clothing. Uh, this is a, another patient, a young man who had very uh, bad eyesight so couldn't work outside really. Ross and Glenn Dinning profited from the asylum contract to supply clothing for patients without other resources and for staff uniforms. They were asked, however, that contract patterns should not be used in the making up of suits for staff, since it could lead to confusion between staff and patients if they're all wearing the same clothes. A dozen popular corsets were returned to the regular supplier Sargod, Sun and Ewan, since they contained metal busks which, you know, had the potential to be dangerous, with the request that they would be replaced with dorset corsets in large sizes. I've, I've tried to look up dorset corsets, but I can't find a very good <laughs> illustration of them. So here we have Truby King ordering corsets uh, for patients, as his work as medical superintendent. Sargoods also provided women's caps. Truby King returned a dozen unsuitable caps, saying, Please send white caps with strings, which would do for old ladies. I think I might be heading for one soon. <laughs> so these are some of the businesses that were locally profiting uh, from supplying the asylum. By the mid-1890s, patients' clothes and bedding were being sent to Rhodes Laundry in Northeast Valley for cleaning. Initially, the um, asylum was try you know, part of the self-sufficiency was to have their own laundry, but it became better to contract that out. I mean, we could write a history of contracting out, couldn't we, over time? <laughs> uh, be very interesting. So, uh, road to laundry was profiting by the mid-1890s. 25 bags of clothes with a total of 1,070 items, including 325 shirts, 106 pairs of drawers, was sent in August 1894. Rhodes, it seems, needed more staff to keep up with the work. Among other businesses that profited from asylum contracts were Briscoe & Co, a and Boots, Hallensteins, Herbert Haynes & Co, uh, Kincaid & McQueen, and the New Zealand Hardware Company. So these are some of these. Uh, so here, here's Rhodes Laundry advertising for, for um, washer, shirt and body linen ironer. Um, so, you know, it's good to remember that fabrics at that time were heavy and needed, you know, the type of laundering and ironing which our modern day fabrics don't uh, require. So it was a lot of work. One of the greatest comforts for the asylum patients was, of course, food. Truby King reformed the asylum food regime and he was determined to make the asylum as self-sustaining as possible. But in the early years, he had to rely on local butchers. The butcher, Mr Patrick, was reprimanded for sending, sending extra fat mutton and for sending more forequarters quarter, of beef uh, than hindquarters. Here's Mr Patrick Ad on um, McLagan Street. A supplier of flour, Stevens & Co, received a sharp letter. You, you wouldn't believe the number of letters Truby King wrote. I, I have sent you a flour bag with some mixture in it, which we found in one of the flour sacks. It looks very much like floor sweepings. Such additions are not desirable in flour, <laughs> and the sack might spoil a batch of bread. I trust, you see, this does not occur again. <laughs> By 1904, the asylum was nearly self-sufficient in its main food items and produced so many eggs that 50 dozen were sent to the public hospital weekly. 
Truby King's Fishing Station, where trusted patients worked also at Karatani, produced a surplus of fish that was sent to other institutions. So here's the farm's productivity in 1913. Um, and this is products that are actually consumed at the asylum. So, uh, you know, five and a half thousand eggs, um, gallons and gallons of milk, butter, mutton, lamb, pigs, pigs for bacon. <coughs> so I don't know why it's always called bacons. I don't understand that, but it must be a language use that's changed. Uh, <coughs> potatoes uh, and tons of vegetables, and he's growing grapes. <coughs> King took considerable pleasure in developing the farm and grounds of the asylum. Um, uh, the, these are the sales, uh, the stuff that's, that they didn't use but sold. And you know, this is also really interesting. They charge for the service of their bull. I suppose people still do that. I'm not a rural person. Is there a rural person here who knows about that? You know, presumably you just do charge for that. So. You know, um, he's a canny guy. He's looking for uh, ways to make money. He won't, you know, he won't give sacks back unless they're reimbursed. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's quite a business enterprise that he is running at the time. So here uh, is Truby King and Bella at home in their house at the asylum. King, however, felt considerable frustration with the location at Seacliff, seeing it as a great disadvantage so far from town and with a limited rail service. It was difficult to take patients to town for entertainments or alternatively to get entertainers to visit since there was nowhere for them to stay and poor transport made for scheduling difficulties. In view of these difficulties, in 1914, he requested that the Inspector General should provide a really first-class cinematograph. He said, <coughs> Nothing affords greater pleasure to the whole institution <coughs> than a suitably selected and well-run picture show, and there can be no doubt, of course, that given due variety, the interest would be sustained and perennial for a show once a week. Judging from the way in which people flock regularly to the picture theatre week after week, year in, year out, in towns, notwithstanding the keen competition of other sources <coughs> of amusement. I need scarcely say there will be no difficulty whatever in arranging with the proprietors of the pictures in Dunedin or with other agents for the loan of first-class films suitable for our purposes on reasonable terms. Provision of films, he suggested, would make, take the patients out of themselves and relieve the tedium and monotony of asylum life. So he was constantly looking for ways to entertain uh, patients and to improve conditions. So, were patients at home in the asylum? The answer, of course, is mixed and difficult to get at. Every casebook entry is fascinating. Each provides insights into the desperation of families and the great variety of experience. I'll give only a few examples here. Mahi T, for example, was committed from Colac Bay on the 19th of November, 1890. Her whanau said she had no sensible speech and was given to occasional violent outbursts. And her husband said, through an interpreter, that he could not continue to watch her any longer. She died in the asylum, far from the crash of the waves on Colac Bay and the tereo of her whanau the following November. Yet, in fact, women were more likely to be discharged from the asylum cured, and there were always more men committed uh, than women. This is just another um, of the patients. In 1931, uh, 30, uh, sorry, <laughs> confusing dates and age, a 31 year old farmer's behaviour became disturbing to his family and he was committed by his father on the 23rd of June 1915. 
The father believed his son Matthew broke down shortly after his brother left for the war, believing that he should go as well. He talked constantly, saw imaginary objects, and believed he was at war. Matthew was incoherent, noisy, not eating, and tore his clothes. In three weeks, he was considerably improved physically and mentally, and on the 18th of August, he was discharged. The short stay clearly assisted him to regain peace of mind. Such a short stay contrasts with that of Joanna Beckett, who I've written about um, probably endlessly. And her first admission to the Seacliff Asylum was in 1887, when she was aged 40. She was admitted and discharged a number of times before her committal in January 1897, accompanied by a letter from her husband which stated, This wife of mine refuses to be ruled by me and goes to the neighbours and annoys them and their children by using bad language, I hear. Yet they refuse to inform of her. She is now in your hands to do to her as the law directs. Discharged again as recovered in July, she was readmitted in December and lived most of her life away from her violent and controlling husband there in the asylum until her death in 1918. She was said to be happy to return to Seacliff, wanting to give her friends there tobacco and snuff which she promised them when she was there last. Uh, she is one of the first, well, I think she's about the second patient divorced on the grounds of lunacy. They introduced divorce legislation in 1911, I think. Um, and when the case goes to court, they produce only her photograph um, as evidence that she's in the asylum. Another patient was devoted to Truby King writing to him as darling and only Truby and dear old socks and signing off lovingly and devotedly yours. One William S. however was less happy writing to his mother in August 1905. I received your letter all right. I am in good health at present. I don't like this place here so good and am working cutting wood every day. I get a letter from my father sometimes and get plenty to eat here, more than I got there. I remain your affectionate son. At time, individuals actually sought admission to the asylum. <coughs> Pregnant outside of wedlock, Martha M. wrote to Truby King from Southland in 1910. Dear Dr. Truby, I want to come to Seacliff. I am going to become the Holy Mother. You knew I was our Saviour's, virgin, Ma Saviour's wife, Virgin Martha. I have no help here. Do help me if you can come for me. The little saviour might get killed here. Save my little baby as you are the leading infant protector. I will come up if you help me. Yours truly, Virgin Martha. So she is the only woman who um, gave birth out of wedlock that I have found in the asylum at that time in Truby King's time up to 1920, and she asked to be there. One of the criminal lunatics, Harry C., a former school teacher who wrote threatening letters to school committee members who had dismissed him, <laughs> wrote to his mother in 1909, you know, this place gets on your nerves. The same dreary old round year in and out makes one stale and very dull. Yet as Jane Adams has noted, Harry C. had his own garden to tend in the, at the asylum, played cricket, and was allowed to take long walks. Jane concluded that his lifestyle was far superior to the one he would have led in Dunedin Jail. If our idea of home is a place of warmth and affection, no doubt the asylum seems wanting. Ooh, what me? Sorry. It's enough to make you cry. <laughs> um, yeah, that's the one I wanted. So, um, 
But it's salutary to remember that many of those admitted were expelled from their homes because of disturbing behaviour. It was their families who incarcerated them, and the wider communities supported keeping lunatics out of sight and secure. The doctor resident at the asylum did his best with a building that was anything but homelike, building additional villas and founding outposts for sufferers from special conditions like alcoholism and epilepsy. And when he went to Wellington to become Director General of Child Welfare, Truby King said that he missed the insane. Um, so I've just put here, um, there's a very interesting podcast about asylums which um, discusses an American farm treatment place today that patients find very therapeutic. It's in Massachusetts. So it's not an idea that's, that's gone away. Uh, you can look at photos at Archives New Zealand and there's more on Joanna Beckett and, and being at the Seacliff Asylum. So thank you. Yeah. Uh, but did you come across anything about Tribune King extending himself into childcare practices? I remember Eric Olson writing about this some years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's a whole other story. But yes, yeah, so um, he's very interesting in the feeding of calves, you know, and coming up with the right mixture for feeding and uh, starts, be, you know, because of the kind of increasing long-stay population in the asylum. Um, he thinks, well, if children were raised properly, we wouldn't get where we are now. Uh, so that's one of the impetuses for Plunkett. And also, he and Bella adopt a child. Um, it's a somewhat um, difficult story to get to the root of it, it's, it's the child of an attendant who I think is widowed and they take her in, so it's not, you know, doesn't, it's hard to know how agreeable that was to her. I don't know the details. Um, but they, so he was then very concerned about feeding that child properly. Um, and I mean, what, what, what really interests me, I mean, I have worked on Plunkett and I've written something about that, um, is that. Truby King, you know, wrote Baby's First Month and The Expectant Mother and Baby's First Month. And, it, you know, if you read it carefully, it says things like, you know, it's really good for mothers to have some time for themselves. It's all right to put the baby at the end of the garden and the sun and the pram, as long as the sat pram's safe. You know, so he, he makes, and he says fathers should pay some attention to their children as well. So it's not all bad. Um, and I think what happens is that the Truby King rule books go on and have a life of their own in the hands of unmarried Plunkett nurses who go by the rules. Whereas Truby King himself was incredibly disorganised. Sometimes he walked to town in his pyjamas. You know, he was just an incredibly disorganised person. So he didn't live by rules himself. But he's a bit crazy himself. Yeah, well, he was. I mean, you know, well, that, that's what... That's why he liked the, you know, he liked talking to the people there. Yeah. Well, the only reason people study psychology is because they want to work out what's wrong with them. Well, <laughs> and the same with oh, yeah. well, we, we could have a discussion about that. But, but I mean, he didn't. He didn't. He had studied mental health at um, in Edinburgh with Thomas Clouston, who was the doyen of of medicine and uh, um, psychiatry in Edinburgh at the time. So he had that training, but when he first came back to New Zealand, he worked at the Wellington Hospital, and he reformed the sanitation there. So he wasn't necessarily planning to go on in, you know, in psychiatry, but this opportunity came up. And it actually really suited him, because he kind of liked the variety and the planning and the farming and the, you know, he liked all aspects of the work, I think. Question. Yep. Yes. 
it's always struck me it's very odd that the grandeur of the architecture that we see in the photographs yeah. of the building would go beyond anything to do with a home. This, the, I mean, it's the Scottish baronial Gothic style, yeah. Yeah. almost revisited in, in, in a French style, yeah. and making for enormously large rooms, which even when Blake Palmer went there to hear a concert of music, yeah. it, it was freezing yeah. in these rooms. There was yeah. in, an impracticality all that, which sits very ill with your the idea of saying, well, it's at home and things... I mean, I'm not... Saying what I'm saying is, I'm what does it... You know, I, I just think it's interesting to raise that question because some of these people had no home. Oh. You know, so, you know, may, maybe being in a bed in an asylum was better than having no bed. That's just one... Mm. But but obviously, there, you know, you saw those the postcards of grand asylums in American Britain. Mm -hmm. People felt it was. People used to feel that about hospitals. Sue, you're here. Sue Hayden, somewhere. I think I saw Sue come in. Yes, yeah, so it's true, Sue, isn't it? That hospitals were built as grand buildings to show like town halls. Town halls. You know, they were built to show the beneficence of the community, and the asylums like that. So it's built to show something about the community's pride and its beneficence. But it's not designed for the people who are going to be there. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a huge amount of money. But they also built prisons in the same style. <laughs> well, yes. <laughs> that's, that's one of the dilemmas. Yeah, it is. I mean, it's kind of interesting, isn't it, about public architecture? Yeah. 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 Well, I was wondering whether he had experimented with patient voice, giving the patients a say in their treatment. Well, treatments were very limited, so that's one thing you have to know, right? There wasn't a great deal. It's not till the 50s, really, that um, you know psychotropic drugs become available, so that allows people to say, we need to get rid of asylums. Um, so he had a limited repertoire of uh, treatment, but he was very keen on this work idea. So if people wanted to do, you know, they wanted to build a guinea pig house, he would make it possible for them to do it. Um, in terms of patient voice, and you know that's why I love Joanna Beckett and why she's here on the cover of this book. You know, he noted when he talked to her because he photographed the patients, right? And he noted she said to me, "I suppose you want me to stick straw in my hair and look like a mad woman." He said she's very witty and apropos. You know, so he, he appreciated her consciousness of this situation. Yeah. Just, yeah. just to comment the idea of work, when we yeah. arrived in Lincoln in the 1970s, we had a gardener who came out from the pulton, one of the residents. Right, they right. Were still, they were still working in the community. Well, look, I mean, a friend of mine, you know, ran gardening for mental... Yeah, survivors or whatever, you know, it, it's a it's a good thing, isn't it? Being in touch with the land, it's not not a bad thing. I, I mean, we've gone from this idea that it's terrible to make people work when you're not paying them, basically, haven't we? So it's better that they sit around and watch TV and are on drugs. I'm being provocative, but <laughs> is that is that you know we've gone from you know you can't exploit people by expecting them to work be terribly exploitative. It's much better that they sit around, do nothing. What do you guys think of that? I don't know. Have you got much into Cherry Farm and Ashburn Hall? No, I haven't. You haven't? No, no. Because I find that I've, I've been in the system for 33 years yeah. and none of the psychiatrists, well actually my psychiatrist is here tonight. You're not supposed Ravi, to, uh, it's co patient and, and confidentiality. Well, often <laughs> I found that um, none of them understood me. Yeah. But I, I remember Dr. Dugavi fondly because we talked about Middle Eastern politics. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that was therapeutic to me, more yeah. therapeutic than the treatment that you gave me. I, I had many a disagreement with you. <laughs> but you're still, you're still my friend. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I mean that Tricky King would have liked that a conversation about politics. I mean, he was a great talker. Yeah.
It was enormous. Yeah. 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 On top of that, he instigated the timber and he began in the Catlins. Catlins, yeah. And on top of that, he had those fishing interests in growing Caratonic. Yeah. What sort of character was he? Well, I think he was very energetic. I think Plunkett took off because uh, the good women of New Zealand thought it was a very good idea. So he galvanised them, but they really took it, you know. Soon there were branches all throughout the country, so he didn't really have to do much apart from give addresses once in a while. Um, but he was really interested in uh, farming, and um, I guess he's one of those last turn-of-the-century people where you can aspire to be a kind of Renaissance character when it becomes much more difficult. You know, he wasn't very happy when he went to Wellington and became director of child welfare. It didn't suit him. He much preferred the variety of things he could do at the asylum. I mean, I think he drove people nuts because he was, he had his latest enthusiasm, you know, so if he saw you on the street and he just thought it would be great to start Plunkett, you wouldn't get away from him for an hour because he'd be telling you why it was such a good idea. But, um, yeah, I mean, you know, I'm just trying to make people rethink why asylums were built because there's a huge you know you can go online I've written about this you know there's a huge gothic dreary there's this there are people called urban explorers or something who love to go into old asylums and film them and make them seem dark and creepy and you know what terrible places they were and often they became terrible places but that wasn't the impetus initially so if I've convinced you of that, I'll be pleased. I think we have to. Is there any other? If you're rich, you're eccentric. If you're poor, you've got a mental illness. <laughs> and be. that's a fact. Yeah. Look yeah. at the spruce goose. Look at how it's used. Yeah. yeah. Any other comments? Barbara, that was wonderful presentation. Everyone's applause.